I'll stop right there, but Beth, thank you so much. Meg and so many of the other grad students wouldn't be where they are if it weren't yeah. for you. Thank, thank you. Well, I think at this point, Meg, I think we will go ahead and start. Okay, that sounds yeah. good. Um, so uh, I would like to welcome everybody. Um, these sorts of events are my absolute favorite where there's the opportunity to watch somebody who has been a student, who's been an up and coming scientist, cross that threshold and go to being a colleague. And Meg, I look forward to that today. Um, as we begin, I'd like to recognize Colin Devitt, Meg's husband, um, I believe is in attendance. And Colin, boy, my heart goes out to you. Thank you, thank you for supporting Meg through all the ups and downs that invariably happen in producing a PhD. Um, this is as much your achievement as her in terms of supporting her. Um, Meg's folks, Mike and Kathy Malone, um, I believe are coming in from Wisconsin. We have her three sisters, Beth, Teresa, and Annie, and perhaps some of their significant others, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and California. And then uh, Collins folks, Rome, Roma and John Devitt also welcome to you. And I think Meg, we were discussing that you may possibly have folks as far afield as Spain and uh, as far in the lower 48, or at least in the United States, as far as Hawaii. Yeah. Um, special thanks to Meg's committee. It's really been wonderful. We have Mark Westneat from the University of Chicago, associate at the Field Museum of Natural History and a co-advisor. Uh, Chris Whalen, now at the Moffitt Cancer Center, um, Roby Mason Gamer and Emily Miner. Uh, one thing is for sure, you probably surmised, there is something very fishy about Meg. Now, not figuratively, of course, in this case, literally, she <laughs> loves fish. She knows fish. She studies fish, including freshwater fishes and particularly marine species. Um, I gather as a teenager while snorkeling on a coral reef that really cemented her love of being in the water and directly being able to observe the fish. In high school, one of her instructors pointed out to her that there are more species of coral reef fish on a single reef in the Indo-Pacific as there are in all of Wisconsin. Take that, Chris Whalen. At any rate, so that I think drove, drove her more towards coral reefs. And then at the College of uh, Charleston in South Carolina, she majored in marine biology, expanding her experiences, and in particularly under the mentorship of Terry Grandy and Marty Berg at Loyola University, uh, she achieved her master's degree working on invasive goby um, associated in some of the streams feeding Lake Michigan. And that was where I had the pleasure of being able to get to know Meg. Uh, Terry, one of our very own from UIC, professor of biology at Loyola for many, many years, very, very kindly invited me to be part of her committee. And what a great committee. And Terry identified as very succinctly when Meg applied to our program, Terry said, you better take her. And uh, Terry could not have been more right. She's been absolutely fantastic to have in the lab. Um, she brought with her collaborations at the Field Museum with David Westneat that also introduced her um, and made connections for her, as you'll see in her research, um, at the Hawaiian um, Institute of Marine Biology in Kanoha Bay in Oahu in Hawaii. Um, in the lab, Meg has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, she's been both a leader and a team player. Uh, for me and for my lab, um, lab members. She's been the senior grad student and has been wonderful within that role. Um, she addresses her emails to all of us with simply dear labbies. Um, networking outside of the group, she has been the face of our lab at the Gordon Research Conferences um, on predation. She's collaborated both within with her fellow grad students, notably Abdel Halloway, who was the last of my PhD students or the prior PhD student to defend his PhD. And more recently with Carlos Polifka, um, a scientist who's also worked with foraging behavior of fish. Um, with Abdel, she's co-authored a paper that was part of his PhD dissertation and published. And he is a co-author on one of her papers that you will see that is now published in Oikos. And she has papers uh, with Carlos Polifka in addition to the 235 pages of her PhD. 
So what does Meg do? She does theory. She does math. She does field, field work. Just about everything that Meg does, she does superbly. Um, as a TA and as a mentor for undergraduates, she's been incredible. She's won the UIC Undergraduate Mentoring Award, uh, the Biological Sciences Graduate Teaching Award, not just once, but twice. She's mentored six different undergraduates. And in fact, Meg, you are the most superb member of the lab I have ever seen, including myself, in managing undergraduates in independent research projects, making it a good experience and bringing out the best in them. I wish I had paid more attention and learned from you. And two of those undergraduates actually went on to win the Hadley Award, to win the undergraduate Hadley Award in research. For her own work that she we're going to see shortly, uh, she received the UIC Biological Sciences Research of Excellence Award, Provost Award, a Learner Gray Fund for Marine Research, Elmer Hadley Graduate Research Grant, Bobner Travel Award, Sigma Xi Grant and Aid Research. As you can see that Meg has been outstanding. Um, both in her TA ship and in her work and her field experiences, I think will cause a twinge of jealousy in many of, the, of us, me as included, in addition to working in Hawaii, which you'll see in a moment, she has research experience in Tahiti and in St. Thomas in the US Virgin Islands. She lists among, lists among her technical experiences, of course, being an advanced open water diver, this I'm particularly impressed with, Meg, is that you're an experienced free diver being able to dive up to 20 meters. I don't know about you guys, I can barely get down two meters underwater, and she's a licensed boat handler. So in all of this, Meg, you have been so wonderful to watch you develop into a, from a graduate student into a first-rate scientist. Me and your fellow labbies, quite simply, we congratulate you and we're going to miss you. So please, we look forward to hearing and share with us your research accomplishments. Thanks, Joel. Um, I'm gonna like start the waterworks already, but thank you so much for that introduction. And thanks to everybody who um, is taking the time to um, be with, here, with me here today and hear about my PhD research. Um, so let's get into it. Okay, let me just switch to laser pointer. Okay, so um, I'm just so excited to be able to tell you a bit of what, what I've been working on these past few years for my PhD. And I thought that I would start by um, telling you about my research a little bit closer to home. Um, so I was lucky enough to conduct work out of the Field Museum of Natural History. And here we see one of their dioramas. This is the Bahama Islands diorama. Um, it's currently on display in the Harris Learning Collection. It was initially um, opened to the public in the Hall of Fishes in 1932. And the collections that went into making this diorama took place nearly 100 years ago um, with an expedition the Field Museum funded to the Bahamas. Uh, the goal that they wanted to have for this for this display was to bring visitors, people from Chicago, from the surrounding Midwest area, um, to a coral reef, maybe a place they've never been before in their life or may never experience themselves. And they wanted to bring people face to face with these fearsome predators, these tiger sharks, as they hunt and chase their prey. In addition to the collections that were made to make this diorama, they collaborated with an um, inventor and a pioneer, J.E. Williamson, who was one of the um, forefathers of underwater videography. And with his technology, he was able to bring field museum researchers down into the coral reefs of the Bahamas and witness for themselves the life on, life on the reef and um, bring some of that lifelike quality back to the display that they made in here in Chicago. And from this diorama, I can make some connections to the various questions that drive my research. First, I'm really interested in understanding predator-prey interactions and um, what, how the ecology of fear works in coral reef systems. I'm also interested in studying fish behavior and answering questions of why fish do what they do. And finally, I um, am interested in understanding relationships between form and functions using biological collections. 
My dissertation re research is comprised of uh, five chapters. For my first research chapter, I show that fear matters and it plays an important role in structuring predator prey uh, communities. Next, I take a, a tool that's been widely applied in terrestrial systems and use it to quantify the foraging behaviors of a coral reef fish. I, I ask questions about how predation risk varies across um, different spatial scales. And through this approach, I was able to target the behaviors of one species of, uh, of wrasse, a type of coral reef fish in Hawaii. And this was remarkable because there is a um, immense diversity of fishes that live on Hawaiian coral reefs. And this indicated to us that there's some uh, resource partitioning that must take place. And perhaps that has to do with um, morphology and biomechanical ability, which I look at in my final chapter. Now, predation plays a really important uh, role in aquatic and marine systems. Um, here, this is really nicely depicted uh, by this artwork by uh, Ray Troll on the left. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And we have a far side comic here on the right. Um, so clearly we can see that uh, predators and their prey um, have an important role. And what we think of normally when we think of predation is the end result, which is that the predator consumes their prey. When we look at the amazing diversity of fishes on coral reefs, um, we can see that predation does play an important, uh, is an important structuring process just by looking at the immense diversity of anti-predator adaptations. When we look at the behaviors of fish, we can also clearly see that predators can impact their prey by simply scaring them. So here we have two um, black tip reef sharks swimming across a sand flat. And this school of fish, clearly um, fear plays an important role in how they're behaving. The role that predators have on impacting their prey can be thought of in two different, um, in two different avenues. First is through the effects that predators have on their prey that are consumptive or lethal. And obviously this has negative consequences for prey. But what people norm might not um, typically consider as an important role that predators have on prey are these non-consumptive effects of predation. And the non-consumptive effects of predation can negatively impact prey by inducing morphological defenses or by inducing behavioral defenses. And my research really focuses on these induced behavioral defenses and in particular um, induced behavioral defenses such as um, changes in foraging behavior in response to predation risk. The ecology of fear is the study of these non-consumptive effects of predation and how they impact populations and communities. One uh, place that may be really good to study the ecology of fear is on remote reefs far from human impacts where we see a higher abundance or biomass of predators relative to their prey. When the collections were made um, nearly 100 years ago for the Bahamas Islands diorama, um, sharks in the Caribbean were described to be so abundant that they were expected at nearly any time and any place. Um, unfortunately, nowadays, uh, such high predator po populations are quite rare on coral reef habitats. Um, there are few places in the world where we see a trophic inversion where predators outnumber prey. And you can find these reefs in the Pacific Line Islands, in Midway Atoll, um, a part of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, in the Caribbean off of Cuba in the um, Jardines de la Reina. Um, that reef system is also being has been described as being inverted. Now, trophic inversion seems to go against the laws of thermodynamics, and researchers have looked at different ways of how this inverted trophic structure may arise. And one of the leading hypotheses is that 
um, there's a mismatch between turnover rates of predators and their prey, where predators that are large bodied and have really low metabolic rates or slow metabolic rates um, are turning over slow relative to their prey, which are small bodied and have really fast metabolic rates. My contribution to this uh, line of research was looking at the role that fear plays in structuring these inverted biomass pyramids. This work was published last year with my collaborator, as Joel mentioned, um, Abdel Holloway. And we had two main questions that we were trying to answer. First, we wanted to look at you know, how does vigilance behavior impact this trophic structure um, with inverted biomass pyramids? And we looked at the role of vigilance, whether it was a fixed trait or a facultative trait, one that could respond to the conditions in place. Then we are also interested in looking at how different trade-offs may impact this interplay between behavior and trophic structure. The main question we are trying to answer again is how does fear influence inverted biomass pyramid structure? And this is actually, it's a hard question to answer, especially if you're looking to do it experimentally or empirically. And so what we did was we turned to ecological theory and um, predator prey population models in order to address this question. So here we have our La Cavaltera predator prey model. And we also incorporated a vigilance term. We used a fixed vigilance term and a facultative vigilance term, which I'm showing here. So vigilance behavior, um, we can think of an animal as responding to the conditions that are placed around them. And we have that embedded with our model here by incorporating a term that gives the conditions of the predator biomass at that point in time and conditions of the prey biomass at that time. So not only are the prey respond, able to respond to the conditions in place, but we can also model what are the costs associated with responding to predators with vigilance. And these costs may manifest themselves in impacting the um, prey's growth rate or their carrying capacity. And when we conduct these models, um, we end up getting results that look like this. This is a state space graph where we have our prey biomass and uh, predator biomass depicted on our axes. And we solve the equations for zero growth isoclines for the prey and the predators. And then we are able to assess the population dynamics of the system. And we look at the population dynamics when they're at uh, until they reach their equilibrium. And we look at the equilibrium if it's in inverted, uh, if it, the system is an inverted biomass pyramid, it will lie above the 45 degree line. But if it's an Eltonian or what we typically think of as a normal um, trophic pyramid, it would be below the 45 degree line. And then we also are, are able to assess how vigilance changes with these changes in predator biomass and prey biomass. The main things we found were in general, um, if prey respond with a vigilance, res uh, respond to predators with vigilance, then that slows energy up trophic levels and works against inverted biomass pyramids. However, when we modeled the uh, prey to have facultative vigilance, this allowed them to cope with the predator biomass that was in place and actually could lead to inverted biomass structure. Also, we found that it was really important to view these systems through the eyes of the prey. There were important uh, parameters that played a role in the structure of these systems, like the effectiveness of vigilance or predator lethality that made it more or less likely to um, have an inverted trophic structure. To conclude for my second chapter, um, we found that optimal vigilance allows prey to cope with high predator biomass. There are these uh, parameters that we view through the eyes of the prey, like how lethal the predator is, that um, play an important role for inverted structure. And then we also conclude that sharks have this important role, um, not only because they're consuming their prey, but also because they're scaring that their prey.
now that we see that fear matters and it has an important role in these um, coral reef systems in particular, I wanted to see how um, prey are actually responding behaviorally um, to predation risk. In the 1920s, when the Field Museum expedition went to the Bahamas, they made observations of fish behaviors by using this photosphere. So this is this contraption that was able to be descended onto a reef and a researcher could um, climb down and make observations and take video through this glass photosphere. And luckily for us today, uh, technology has just increased by leaps and bounds. And so we're able to buy a GoPro for just a couple hundred dollars and put it on a reef and make really great observations of fish behaviors, which is what I did. Um, you may be wondering, well, how do you go about and actually measure predation risk in a coral reef fish? And so to answer that, we turn to foraging theory. And we can look at this aerial image of a coral reef habitat and clearly see that resources are not spread evenly across this coral reef. And a fish, as it's swimming across the reef, has to make decisions not only of what they're going to eat, but when and where they're going to, to eat food. And once they find a food patch, they have to decide how thoroughly and how long they're going to stay there to deplete that food source. And that is known as, uh, as patch use. We look to patch use theory then to answer the question, well, how long should you stay in a food patch? And we, um, through the marginal value theorem, we know that a forager should stay um, at a given food patch into the point where the benefits no longer outweigh the costs of, of staying there, in which point they will leave or give up. Experimentally, we can measure this quitting harvest rate um, through the giving up density technique. And this allows us to measure the various costs that are associated with foraging at a food patch. Um, an analogy that uh, you can use, uh, we can use to think about this is if when you open a fresh new peanut butter jar, there's the nice swirl on top. It's nice and easy to make your peanut butter sandwich. Over time, you're depleting that patch until you get to a point like we see here on the bottom where there's those last drugs. Um, it's perhaps a little bit harder, more effort needed to get those last bits of peanut butter, at which point you say, it's no longer worth my time, I'll open a new jar. So that point is the giving up density. And perhaps like, like um, what I typically do is I'll give it to our dog and he has a lower giving up density than I do and he'll get those last bits. Okay, so the GUD um, is how we measure the costs associated with foraging. And those costs can be the metabolic costs of foraging, predation risk, and missed opportunities. Experimentally, we can standardize a food source that is provided within an experimental food patch to um, control for the metabolic costs of foraging. And then we can deploy experimental food patches over smaller spatial and temporal scales to control for missed opportunity costs associated with foraging. And that allows us to really hone in and ask questions about um, predation risk as measured with the giving up density technique. The giving up density technique has been used widely in terrestrial systems. So we have a couple of examples here. Um, and what it entails is uh, deploying an, a food patch with a known starting amount of food embedded within a substrate. Maybe it's made a little bit more difficult like it is in this patch here. Um, it's left out for foragers to forage. When um, they're done foraging, you, you can um, collect the food patches, me measure the food that's remaining, and that's your giving up density. Um, so here we have an Arctic ground squirrel, some dark-eyed juncos, a goat, uh, our neighborhood fox squirrel, all, um, all different systems that have been used to measure perceived predation risk with the giving up density technique. Uh, it was my challenge then to go and apply this to a coral reef system. In particular, I was interested in targeting the foraging behaviors of the saddle wrasse. Um, this is one of the most common um, species on Hawaiian coral reefs. It's a generalist invertivore, and um, it's a really important avenue of energy transfer in uh, Hawaiian food web systems. 
I offered a buffet of different food types and patch designs to try and get these uh, study organisms to forage for me. Um, and after lots of challenges and failures, I was able to su successfully come up with the experimental design of the krill burrito. Um, so here you can see a bunch of happy saddle wrasse uh, swimming in to forage from the krill burrito, um, which successfully measured the guts of these fish. And what was amazing was we were able to target just this one species and their foraging behaviors out of a possible 481 uh, reef associated fishes and Hawaiian reefs. So we could ask questions of just one. The next question I had was, well, what is the patchy strategy that these fish employ? And to answer this question, I conducted some experiments where we manipulate the prey um, richness in a food patch. And we can make predictions by their gut on what foraging strategy that they use. So we have high uh, initial prey density in the solid line uh, and low initial prey density in the dashed line. And if a forager uses the fixed amount strategy, they're simply foraging to meet a minimum energetic requirement and the guds will reflect that. If a forager uses a fixed time strategy, um, they perhaps do not assess the patch quality accurately or they live in an environment where resources are distributed um, evenly across space. And so um, they simply forage for a fixed amount of time and then move on. However, a uh, forager can use the quitting harvest rate strategy. And this indicates that they're able to accurately assess the uh, resource uh, patch richness. And we would expect to see a higher proportion foraged from rich patches compared to poor patches. I conducted experiments where I manipulated patch richness and patch density or uh, sorry, and patch uh, substrate density or the difficulty of the food patch. And I deployed them across reefs in Hawaii. The results from these studies are presented by proportion removed. And here with the study looking at initial prey density, we saw that RAS, saddle wrasse do indeed preferentially forage from the richer food patches. When we manipulated the, uh, the substrate density of these experimental food patches, we saw that again, um, they were able to uh, feed or preferentially foraged from easier food patches. Um, so from this, we were able to conclude that these fish use the quitting harvest rate foraging strategy and that they're able to accurately assess the um, patch quality. I next was interested in understanding, well, how does behavior at this crow burrito reflect the natural foraging behavior of these fish across coral reefs? So in conjunction with the giving up density experiments, I deployed remote GoPro cameras at the food patch. So here's the GoPro camera, here's the curl burrito. We have some saddle wrasse swimming right in um, and some sea cucumbers hanging out nearby. Um, so we were able to, to record behaviors at the curl burrito. And then I also conducted um, behavioral observations of individual fish as they were naturally swimming across reefs and foraging. The results from this study are presented here, where I have in the solid colored lines the data from uh, remote video, and then on the dashed lines the data from, um, these are averages from direct observations. And I'll draw your attention to a couple of things. So the behaviors that I've um, presented here are group size, bite rates, chase rates, and inspection rates at the curl burrito. And what we can see is that um, with all of these behaviors, they decline with time as the saddle wrasse reach their gut. Uh, once they reach their gut, these behaviors reflect those of fish as they're naturally foraging across the reef, like we see in group size and chase rate. We also can see that saddle wrasse as they're naturally foraging on um, coral reefs from the, as seen from the direct observations. These fish are, um, are preferentially targeting their efforts, their foraging efforts to rich food sources. 
um, as their uh, average foraging rates from direct observations were higher than those uh, at the gut. So we conclude that um, behaviors at the krill burrito reflect those of fish as they're feeding from a rich and transient food source. And they typically are um, targeting uh, rich food sources on reefs. And this could maybe lead to the, um, to the um, homogenizing their prey across different, um, different reef habitats. With this information about the saddle wrasse foraging behavior, I can now go out and ask questions about how predation risk varies across different spatial and temporal scales. And what was great about this is because we were able to target the behaviors of just this one species, we can ask questions with this entire food web, the complex food web of Hawaiian reefs intact. And these fish experience diffuse predation from no less than 18 different predatory species. Um, so we were wondering, you know, how do they view their environment and say in terms of safety and risk? At a larger spatial scale, I looked at how risk varies away from the reef as you're moving onto the reef and placed patches in adjacent sand flats, at the reef edge, and into the reef environment. Here, this data is presented as the GUD, so high bars indicate low foraging and high risk. And here we see the sand represents risky habitat and risk declines as you move onto the reef. And what's great about this type of study is we can answer the question, you know, why aren't these fish swimming in the adjacent sand flats? Um, and one of the reasons why could be that, well, there's no food there, but here we're spent experimentally putting food there and we can actually say, no, it's because there's um, higher perceived predation risk. Next, within the reef, I was interested in seeing how risk varies across habitat zone. And I conducted a study where I placed the krill burritos in, on transects from the reef flat at the crest and on the slope. And um, what was interesting is that we saw that there was a really flat response. There's no difference in the giving up densities between these habitat zones. So it seems that if you're um, viewing the, the system from the eyes of a saddle wrasse, risk decreases as you move onto the reef. And once you're there, it's safe. And this was a little bit surprising to me. I did think that there was gonna be a difference in these reef habitat zones. Um, because at the slope and the crest, perhaps they're more exposed to pelagic transitory predators. Um, here I'll show you some video from the krill burrito. Our saddle wrasse are foraging up into a point where they all swim away, duck into cover as two bluefin trevally swim past. Now, the bluefin trevally are the most common predator of these species. And from the video, I was able to document predator occurrence rates. Um, so the different types of predators that I observed were um, this invasive species. This is a peacock grouper or roy. Um, if you have good eyes, you can spot the cryptic predator here. This is a lizard fish um, that is a sit and wait predator waiting for an unsuspecting fish to swim by. Another predatory species is the crocodile needlefish. This is a pelagic species um, right here at the top of, of the image. I made comparisons of predator occurrence rates across these different habitat zones. And overall, it was rare to see predators in this video, these videos, but we did see a higher um, predator rate at the slope and the crest than we did the flat. Um, so if there were higher predator occurrences in these uh, different habitat zones, why weren't their guts reflecting that? Well, one hypothesis is that this 3D environment that is in the deeper waters of the slope and at the crest actually prov provides more space, 3D space, for these fish to escape into. And so despite there being more predators there, uh, they're actually more likely to escape predation in these deeper habitats. To conclude from this chapter, I showed that we can measure the giving up densities of a coral reef fish using the krill burrito. 
Um, the saddle wrasse, they employ the quitting, quitting harvest rate foraging strategy and behavior at the Crow Burrito reflects uh, wrasses foraging from rich and transient food sources on reefs. Finally, we were able to see that the giving up density technique allowed us to successfully quantify the foraging costs associated with predation risk. Unfortunately, in Hawaii, um, there's the uh, reefs are experiencing habitat degradation. So um, here we have an infographic depicting habitat, the process of habitat degradation um, and the spectrum that reefs can be. And the reefs in the system that I was working at, um, there were some that were heavily um, degraded in a, a critical state, but they would be, I, you would observe them kind of across this spectrum. So they weren't all the same. Um, the coral reefs in Hawaii, the main global stressor that is impacting these reefs is um, global climate change. And unfortunately, um, in 2015, there was a, a global bleaching event. And I'll, uh, you'll see that here is a, a healthy coral reef in Maui. And uh, in November of that year, temperatures increased and many of these corals bleached. So here you can see them in um, all bleached in white. When temperatures remain high for an extended period of time, these corals will die. And um, it's possible that we'll see a shift of these coral reef systems from being coral dominated, like we see here on the left, the before image, to an algal dominated system. And many of the reefs within Kaneohe Bay, where I did my research, are um, in a degraded state. And so here's an image from one of the reefs. You'll notice it's quite flat. You have some small coral colonies, um, but there's a lot of dead coral and the coral is covered with like a fine filamentous algae. Now, um, habitat degradation, it could alter the trade-offs that a, a fish experiences on the reef. You could imagine that living in this flat environment would mean it's a riskier habitat. There's less uh, structure, less refuge for you to hide in. But on the other hand, as an invertivore, like our saddle wrasse are, um, they actually preferentially feed from dead coral, the invertebrates that are hiding within dead coral and coral rubble. So it could actually pr provide more resources um, for these invertebrate species. So I was interested in looking at how habitat degradation influences these trade-offs of risks and rewards of life on coral reefs. I returned to my study system. This is Kaneohe Bay on the windward, windward side of Oahu in Hawaii. And this was a really great study system to um, answer these questions. Um, here we have uh, aerial image. Um, there's multiple pat, uh, reef types in Kaneohe Bay, a fringing reef, a barrier reef that protects the bay. And then within the bay, there's multiple patch reefs. <clears throat> These patch reefs are experiencing uh, or have experienced a local stressor that um, impacts the reef quality. Um, since the 1970s, there's been an invasive algae. Um, it's a carpeting algae we can see here that sits right on top of the coral and it smothers the coral. So beneath it, um, anything, any coral living beneath this algae will die. Um, the Hawaii Division of Aquatic Resources has been really successful at mitigating the threats from this invasive algae. Um, they've physically removed a lot of these algal mats, and they've also deployed um, sea urchins to help as a, a type of biocontrol. And so um, while they've removed a lot of the algae, Unfortunately, um, the effects of habitat degradation are, are long lasting. And so because of this algae, a lot of these coral reefs um, have had a significant die off. The Hawaii Division of Aquatic Resources um, has ranked each of these patch reefs based on the um, algal presence or historic algal presence on each of these reefs. And I used their ranking system to select reefs that would be degraded um, based on past algal impact. And those are indicated here in brown and orange. 
And then I also selected reefs that are really close by that had little to no um, history of algal presence. And these reefs were in really great, uh, in good state, had a high coral cover. And so um, I wanted to answer the question of how does habitat degradation impact um, risk and activity on these five different reefs in Hawaii. I conducted a giving up density experiment where I deployed um, my krill burrito at 15 stations per reef for 10 experimental days. At the reef scale, I assessed different aspects of the uh, benthic and fish communities. I measured uh, coral rugosity or the structure, um, the benthic communities, the saddle wrasse density, and we can infer that uh, a reef that is high in resource availability um, would support a higher wrasse population or higher density of wrasses. And then I also assessed the fish communities. Then at the station scale, in addition to collecting data on the giving up density, I looked at the microhabitat parameters and the coral cover and the benthic community. I am going to present first the giving up density data in the form of um, these heat maps. Um, these are also referred to as a landscape of fear or a reefscape of fear in our case. And so with these heat maps, we have the uh, cooler colors indicates higher forag foraging activity and a, a safer uh, habitat. And the cooler color or warmer colors, excuse me, indicate a low foraging activity and higher risk. And we can see that on each of these uh, reefs, there's a different reef shape of fear. They are quite varied. And in particular, what I'll draw your attention to is uh, reef 16 has uh, the highest risk and reef 13 south has the lowest risk. And so these fish were telling us that they're viewing um, this reef as scary. And the, um, uh, giving up density data here presented by reef show that again the higher there's a higher average good on our highest um, our reef with the highest algal impact. I'll play some video from these two different reefs. And I'll have you pay attention to a couple of different things. First, you can see that these reefs look very different. On the left, there's a high coral cover, a lot of structure. On the right, <clears throat> there's a lot of coral rubble. It's pretty flat. Um, you can see the sea urchins that have been uh, released on this reef. And then you'll also notice that there's a difference in the activity at these patches where on our um, safe reef, there's a lot of wrasse activity and on our risky reef, there's very little wrasse activity. I was interested in seeing if there were effects of um, the giving up density with microhabitat and conducted an uh, analysis of covariance and found that these fish were not responding to aspects of the habitat at the krill burritos. This was initially shocking. I thought for sure they would value having um, refuge available nearby. But if we consider the anti-predator strategy that these fish employ, it starts to make a bit more sense. These fish are highly visual species. Um, they are, their goal is to see a predator in these, these clear tropical waters as soon as possible and then swim away and they're very fast swimmers. So it makes sense that they're responding to risk at a reef scale instead of a microhabitat scale. Next, I looked at the fish communities and here's the data for the saddle wrasse densities across these different reefs. And what I show is that on our, um, our safe reef, Reef uh, 13 South, we have a reef that supports a higher density of fish, which indicates there's more resources available to support this, uh, these wrasse. We also look at the, um, the community of fishes that are present on these reefs. And I see that um, in general, these reefs look pretty much the same in fish communities with the exception of reef 16, um, which differs than the rest. I looked at this um, data further. So our risky reef, reef 16, has a different fish community. And when we look at the relative abundances of the 10 most common species, um, 
we see that there is a higher uh, relative abundance of this dark blue. This is our other category. And so I looked at what species are represented in um, this other category. And what I found was that these species have a higher, um, are morphologically defended. And so not only are we seeing that these, uh, the risky reef, reef 16, um, the fish are behaving differently, but we're also seeing differences in the community um, of fish that live there that would indicate high risk. To conclude for this chapter, I showed that saddle wrasse are perceiving risk at larger spatial scales. The risky reefs uh, show differences in both behavior and fish communities, and that habitat degradation may alter the trade-offs of risk and rewards on coral reefs. And this is an important thing to consider for conservation and management efforts. For my final chapter, I bring things home back to Chicago to the Field Museum, where I was interested in looking at relationships between form and function in wrasses, but now looking at wrasses as predators themselves of invertebrate prey. We remember that um, I targeted the foraging behavior of saddle wrasse alone in this complex, diverse fish community. And um, this indicated to us that there's probably extensive resource partitioning that's occurring on these reefs. Um, these fish may partition resources by living in different habitat types, but they could also be partitioning resources in their morphologic, morphology and biomechanical ability and in their behaviors, which led us to successfully target the behavior of saddle wrasse. I was interested in addressing the question of how does cranial shape, um, so morphology associated with feeding, change throughout ontogeny or development within the thalassoma wrasses. Now thalassoma is a, a global clade of wrasses and um, they're quite common on coral reefs. And in general, these species exhibit a generalist feeding morphology. With the exception of Gomphosis varus, uh, the bird wrasse we see here has a specialist morphology. I conducted a collections-based study where I looked at the morphologies of these nine different species. I um, dissected and photographed and digitized specimens from museum collections and looked at ontogenetic series from post-settlement juveniles through uh, terminal phase adults. From these um, morphological studies, we can look at um, the development and trajectory of cranial shape for these nine different species. And what we see, I'll draw your, your attention to, is that there are differences indeed in the developmental trajectory magnitude and angle of some of these species with in particular Gomphosis varius, which is in light blue. Um, if we track its development throughout our morphospace, so here is uh, differences in cranial shape, we can see that as a post-settlement juvenile, it looks quite similar to other thalassoma wrasses. With development, it starts to diverge from other thalassoma species as the jaws elongate until the terminal phase adult, which has these elongate, really shocking elongate jaws. We also see that these changes in cranial morphology were really associated with differences in elongation happening at the anterior jaws and the rest of cranial morphology was pretty conserved compared to other um, thalassoma species. And this jaw elongation has really important functional consequences, which we modeled um, using the geometry of um, these different skeletal and muscle, uh, muscle components of the jaws. And we see again that there are differences with the elongate jaws of the bird wrasse as we'd expect. And these jaws are great for, um, for having a fast bite, uh, fast opening jaws that can let them eat evasive prey from the crevices of reefs. And the other thing that I'll draw your attention to is that um, there is a lot of overlap in these other thalassoma species. So similar biomechanical abilities may lead us to conclude that 
Um, these fish are partitioning resources when they're uh, co-occurring, they're partitioning resources behaviorally and not because of differences in bio biomechanical ability. And um, it makes sense that these species as generalist invertivores would be very similar. And um, this strategy of uh, kind of having a general morphology and similar biomechanical ability made them al allow them to be successful on coral reefs and kind of serve as a, a jack of all trades um, strategy. To conclude for this final chapter, we see that the bird wrasse exhibits unique allometry and cranial shape, uh, and this development was really driven by elongation in the anterior jaws. We saw that there's differences in both uh, morphology and biomechanical ability, and these differences may help us explain how wrasses partition resources on coral reefs. Uh, for my PhD, I really took this a broad look at different ecological and evolutionary principles and applied them to a coral reef system. My different chapters provide us insights into um, behavior of these coral reef fish, their morphology. We see that um, fear matters and it plays a really important structuring role in the um, trophic dynamics of uh, pristine coral reef systems in particular. And then we also see that we should look at habitat degradation in terms of trade-offs of risks and rewards of life on coral reefs. And with that, I just want to just take a moment to thank everybody for joining me um, here today to hear about my research. Um, I am so grateful to have been able to uh, work with these great people. And this is where I cry again. <laughs> um, thanks, Mark and Joel in particular. Um, Abdel, my collaborator on a bunch of different projects. I'm so lucky to work with you and work with everybody here. Um, so thank you. Um, I also just need to take a moment and acknowledge the really great undergrads that I was able to work with. And I'm crying again. <laughs> um, so I, I taught um, ecology lab at UIC and was able to really work closely with these students. Um, and they're really great. Um, so Gregorio here on the left helped with collecting um, benthic community data from uh, images. Uh, Franny helped me look at uh, group sizes in um, from my GoPro videos. Kim did a project at the Field Museum where she looked at fish behaviors. And Humer, um, he worked uh, at the Field Museum as well and looked at um, differences in um, silver sides. He's the silver side expert. And then I also have to thank Max and Mikkel for including me in the Northwest Passage project. This was the most gratifying experience I had at UIC. And it was so great to see all of these students just like thrive and excel. So uh, it was really glad to be a part of that project. And then my family, my mom and dad, um, my sisters, the Devitts, my nieces and nephews, and then of course, uh, Colin, I love you, and Petey as well. <laughs> so there's a lot more people to thank, my committee, all the Brown Lab, lab uh, Westmeat Lab members, Caleb, Susan, Kevin, um, people at the, in Hawaii who helped me conduct my field work, Beth and Suzanne, thank you. And then um, to anybody who contributed to my experiment.com uh, crowdsourcing campaign, um, thank you so much. So I'm happy to answer any questions and um, thanks for joining. So I think I saw Roy's hand. Hey. Roy, please go ahead. Roy? No, that was a clap. I was clapping. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, that was a clap. I'm sorry. Okay, so <laughs> what we'll do is if people have questions, hey, talk. yes, so definitely an applause, Meg. That was really super. If people have questions, feel free to either ask or if you want to type them in the chat, I'll be happy to read them out or just say you would like to uh, ask a question. Great to see everybody. I'll jump in, Meg, this is Carlos. Um, <clears throat> and I just have really, really basic questions because it, um, 
Oh, and first of all, great job, by the way. Um, very, very impressive and very, uh, uh, very well presented. It was really easy to follow your talk. Um, <clears throat> so that's why I just have very basic questions. And of course, um, I got kind of three of them, so I'll dominate the floor for a second. But um, I'm always interested in how to measure guds in fish, of course, as you know. And um, I wondered if, because you've got a fairly diverse community there on your reef, if you had any problems with other species eating from your krill burritos when you were trying to measure saddle rests. Yeah. Guns. Um, so initially in the development of the curl burrito design, I was getting foragers, um, so other species, scrawled file fish, and I, I was going to put pictures in and I did it, now I'm regretting it. Um, so scrawled file fish and millet seed butterfly fish were the culprits. But once the, once I had the curl burrito with the mesh size uh, kind of uh, figured out, it was just saddle wrasse, which was like, Awesome. It was great for me. Um, and I did have one instance of, uh, I think it was a, a yellow margin eel that kind of like wrapped up around it, but it wasn't able to forage at all from the patch. Um, so, so yeah, it wasn't a problem, which was, was lucky for me. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Another, um, sort of a weirder question, basic question is that, so on the, on the degraded reefs, um, the the algal dominated I, I understand I basically understand what was going on but I'm just kind of curious so it's an algal dominated reef and I, and I know it's lower productivity but I was wondering if you ever considered or if there was any reason to suspect that the the um that the algal fronds and whatever would provide some cover and that you might actually yeah yeah so this study you know I selected my sites um one year and then when I went back, they actually had a huge die off of the algae. So it was no longer there. So that wasn't um, a factor at all on any of these reefs um, because the algae had removed, its impacts were still there. Um, so so in, a, in a way that wasn't something that could increase cover, but yes, um, in other systems, perhaps the, the higher mats would create more uh, kind of hiding refuge opportunities. Okay, and last question. Um, I, and I'm not sure that maybe this is something that you didn't can have uh, an answer for, but what about, what happens at night? Do you know what happens at night? Is there any change? Yeah, in so um, these, these fish just like speak to my heart. They are early to bed, late to rise. Um, so there's been some like cool, fun studies from like the 60s and 70s where they'll act, they actually would sit on the reef and watch in time when they'd go into their little hidey hole at night. Um, so yeah, no foraging at night. They're, they're sleeping. Okay. Well, thanks for those answers. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. Certainly would like to invite any other questions. But if there are no further, oh, Mark, did you have a question? There we go. I have a very basic question. When you, when you talk about fear, um, and it particularly applies to sharks, um, does it depend on the uh, sharks not really using surpri surprise as much as other predators, but actually um, being pretty obvious to the prey? Yeah. So, you know, the hard thing with looking at some of these predator prey systems is it's really, it's rare to witness a predation event. Um, so, yeah, and, and one of the things that got me interested in these inverted biomass pyramid reefs was because a researcher in California had approached me and said, I work on this reef and these fish are not afraid of the sharks. Um, so I think they're getting different types of cues from these predators. And I definitely think they play a role. Um, and we're still trying to figure out like what are the differences in acute responses 
versus the chronic level of threat on the reef. So there's a lot of different teasing apart of um, these predator prey systems that still needs to be done. Um, so hopefully I can answer that for you a little bit better someday. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, there's a question here that I'm reading in from Audrey Frieschel, who's actually a member of Moffat. Yeah. And she asks you, Meg, do you think the behavior of the prey will over be over time due to the inverse biomass pyramids? So I, I meant to write change over time, sorry. Go for it, Audrey, no, no, please go ahead and state your question. Yeah, so, you, you, so it was right, I just, my fingers didn't type out my thoughts correctly. Um, so I was wondering what, um, if you think there's long-term changes in the prey behavior um, due to this sort of inverse biomass um, phenomenon. Uh, so the way the way we modeled it was that the vigilance behavior was a, a quick response. Um, we could also model it in a way that it's, uh, um, takes a, a longer time to respond and maybe we would get at more of a like an evolution of vigilance responses in that way. Um, but but yeah, the, the way we approached it was looking at it as a, a quick immediate, like what are the conditions in place? Um, but we, we could maybe model it differently to look at kind of more evolutionary trends and uh, vigilance responses. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I've got a very simple question. Uh, great job on this, Meg. Um, I was just wondering, actually, because I can't recall, how many versions of the krill burrito did you have until you sort of ended up like, with the version that you had work, like that you yeah. could actually have worked? And, and Mark's uh, part of this, and I don't know if Sarah is here, but um, Sarah is from Hawaii and helped me come up with the krill burrito. Um, oh my gosh, so we put out- Lots. Squid. Yeah, we put out bricks. We put out food pellets. We put out um, little snails or something. Uh, so there were a lot of different iterations. Um, and at first, they were they were quite neophobic. They seemed like you know they did not want to check it out. Um, but I really you know once I figured out kind of what they liked, um, then it was like smooth sailing from there. And um, yeah, what was remarkable was being gone for a whole year, I returned to the reef and the, the fish came up to, I had a, a boogie board. So I was pretty like a, a unique person on the reef and the fish were coming up to me. Like they remembered me from a year prior. So, um, so yeah, they were, they were enthusiastic participants. <laughs> They're smart, you know, they, they are you, smart. You put a you put a brick down there with a big shrimp on it and they will not touch it, but you put the same shrimp on a piece of coral and they'll go crazy. It's <laughs> <laughs> so it was fun trying to, to feed the, the wrasses and um, they liked me by the end of the summer. <laughs> Well, if there are no additional questions, Meg, congratulations. Thank you for a wonderful seminar. And I would like to thank everybody for joining and uh, participating in this seminar. So at this point, Meg will be moving to the closed door portion of the event. So to the committee. Um, so as far as the committee is, we'll take a 10 minute break. Uh, give a chance okay. to, at this point in the day, get some tea, coffee, beer, wine, whatever is so suitable at this point uh, for the defense. And then Meg, we'll go ahead and let's say I've got 436. Well, let's see. Why don't we say we will go ahead and reconvene at 450. So that'll give everybody 14 minutes, if that sounds good. And um, so the committee and Meg, we'll see you in just a little bit. And to everybody else, thank you so much. Thanks. Hi, Sarah. I see you. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. Bye, Hanky.